welcome everybody. Uh, I'm going to call the meeting to order. Uh, and just to get things started, I want to just give a big shout out to the snow removal team for the city and DPW. Oh my gosh. We are so grateful. I've heard such uh, great things, such appreciatory things of their work over the last, what, three days, yeah. something like that. It's been, like they've been working um, uh, to exhaustion, basically, and uh, we're so grateful for their work. So just want to say that first. Um, first thing is to, uh, the other first thing, is to review and approve the agenda. Uh, and I don't think we have any changes to the agenda. Does, am I wrong about that to anybody's knowledge? I think it's as okay. advertised. Okay, so we're going to consider the uh, agenda approved without objection. Uh, so on to general business and appearances. So this is a time for any member of the public to address the council on some item that is otherwise not on our agenda. So, And if you have something to say, if you would uh, say your name and where you live and try to keep your comments to two minutes or less. And with Donna not here, I will keep track of time. One of my rare appearances. Good evening to all. My name is Richard Shear from Loomis near Main Street. And uh, I just had a question about transportation policy, which is something that really isn't on the agenda. Could you get up right on the mic? Sure. Uh, is the mic on? OK, good. And I'll speak a little louder, Jack, anyway. Uh, I'm here to speak to transportation policy, which isn't on the agenda, hasn't been on the agenda for a while, and basically I'm not questioning the 40000 that's embedded in the budgets at all. I'm not, that, that is in the budget. What I'd like is I'd like better understanding as Green Mountain Transit is about to release, Donna, I'm, I'm right, I don't know, you're on the Transportation Committee, that Green Mountain Transit will make public soon their planning that they've been working on for a long while. That's correct, but they're also going to be making some reductions. Ooh. Okay, and I know there'll be a public meeting on that sometime in February, I believe. But what I'm wondering is the process of the city's 40,000 on, um, on transportation. Whether this is a no-bid contract to, Jeep, to Green Mountain Transit, or whether this is 40,000 that's going to be allocated for transporting people around our town, and basically, will that go out in the form of an RFP? And if Green Mountain Transit has the most effective way of doing it, certainly they would continue with it. But if there are other alternative models, that's the first part of the question. And the second is, how much connection the schools have had with the city council and their transportation planning since the schools are planning to allocate 120,000 for the transportation of 150 students. So if, if I could just have a couple of minutes on when the city is planning to discuss unified transportation. Boy, that was a lot in two minutes. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Oh, don't forget to say your name and where you are from. Did, did he? Did. Oh, I'm yeah. so sorry. I totally like missed it. Just, I think I was getting my phone, but that's what happened. No, that's you great. Heard it enough. Yeah, <laughs> no worries. Uh, great question. Um, I think that's something that we could uh, absolutely take up at a future meeting. Um, I think it's probably worth talking about. So let's, uh, I, I can't tell you exactly when that would be right now, but let's be in touch about when we might have a more um, robust conversation about that. Yes? I would just like to make sure you realize that 40000 doesn't pay for it all. That's right. a subsidy to state and federal dollars. Absolutely. Just, okay. Absolutely. And I'd like to know where the state is involved in this. What, uh, so Donna, would you be the point person on council on that issue? Sure. <laughs> Notice not how to, I delegate but, Donna into this. But That's not to all put you I have to say. Thank you so okay. very much. I'll get home on a rainy night. Okay. Thank you. Hi, Dan Dickerson, Montpelier resident. Uh, this relates to bike path access. I live on uh, Charles Street, which I don't know if anybody's familiar, but it basically flows from the, sort of the college area down to Barrie. I often find myself walking down to access the bike path, so I cut through that parking lot where the new apartment is um, and access it across the railroad tracks or I go to the co-op. Um, and this sort of stems from me walking down uh, a few days ago after the big snowstorm, so obviously this is sort of a one off, well, not a one-off occurrence, but a rare occurrence. And I found a giant mountain of snow 
blocking the path or the desire line, as you would call it, um, you know, to the bike path and to the co-op. And I guess I just wanted to, you know, suggest or, or wonder if there's a way that the city might, because there are a lot of people that actually walk down Charles and, and access the bike path and the co-op uh, through that little <coughs> corridor. And I'm wondering if there's a way for the city to potentially negotiate with the railroad and maybe the, the property owner to get like a formal pathway as opposed to the sort of informal dirt track that, that currently flows there. I think there's enough traffic to warrant it. And I think given that the bike path is gonna be extended, you know, much further out, um, I think there might be a much greater desire of people to walk down Charles or come from Barrie and access the bike path through that means. So I. Just as a suggestion, it would be nice to have a formal pathway to, to access the, the path and the co-op. Um, thank you. Thank you. That's a great idea. We can certainly talk more about that. Uh, Ashley? Should council bring up business that's not on the agenda? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so I had sent an email uh, earlier, but um, I've been following what the state is doing in terms of federal workers who are out of work and not getting paid. Um, and I don't know what authority the city has or uh, anything like that, but um, I know that there are, I think there's about 1,500 federal employees that live in Vermont, 1,600 maybe. Um, and I want to make sure that it's something that's on our radar. Uh, if tax bills are coming due, you know, any of those things, we have no idea when the federal government is going to reopen. And uh, our president just approximately eight minutes ago indicated that grocery stores will just give you credit to buy food um, sort of whenever you want it. Um, so that's not a practical reality for a lot of folks who are living paycheck to like a few days before next paycheck. And so I want the city to sort of start thinking about ways that um, we can be a little bit flexible on things that we wouldn't ordinarily be, but I think it's sort of extraordinary circumstances. And I'm certainly interested in that. Do you want to follow up with thinking about options? So I, I just add, you, uh, Ashley had asked an email um, about this, and I'm uh, so sorry to get back to you. We've been nope, uh, it's fine. trying to figure out what the legal options are. You have are. a life bill? You do other <laughs> things? Nope. <laughs> you, you say jump, I say how high. Um, no, so we're trying to find out what the what our legal choices are. I mean, I think obviously it would be the question of whether we could waive interest and penalties on late taxes, those kind of things. So, I, and I don't know what flexibility we have in the law. Thanks for putting it on the radar. Uh, anyone else? Uh, Donna. There seems to be a strong echo. I don't know if I'm the only one who hears it. There is. Is there anything that can be done about it? Reverb. <laughs> Are we that lit already? That yeah. is just my ears. I guess I don't mind it because it tells me that you all can hear. <laughs> I okay. like knowing, but it's all so, yeah. All right, there you go. Yeah, fair enough. Um, whatever works. Okay. Uh, any anyone else? Okay. All right, so on to the consent agenda. Is there a motion regarding the consent agenda? I move the consent agenda. Second. Further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so we have some appointments to make. Um, there are a number of appointments where there was uh, one person applying um, for one position or two people applying for three positions, you know, something where, um, something like that. So uh, w uh, we could just make all those appointments together um, f at first, or we can um, hear from everybody and then go into executive session and then come back and announce them all. What's your preference? Let's do the second one. Okay, so we'll hear from everybody, go into executive session, and then come back and make all the appointments. Okay, great, so uh, there are, uh, appointments to be made to the Social and Economic Justice Committee, um, Investment Committee, Tree Board, and Solid Waste uh, Management uh, Committee. So uh, I'm not, a, we don't have to necessarily go in order unless, well, let's, let's go in order. How about that? <laughs> Structure is good. I'm trying to be more structured here. Okay, uh, so let's start with uh, if there's anyone here from the uh, Social and Economic Justice uh, or uh, applying to those, that committee. You would come on up and introduce yourself and tell us about your interest in that committee. I am Shana Casper on 21 Kent Street. I just moved there last year, and I think I'm mostly interested just to uh, get to know more about what's happening in Montpelier and to um, learn more about uh, how we can make it a more inclusive place. I put a lot more in my office, but that's the short bit. Okay. 
Great. Any questions? Thanks. So okay, much. thank you. And I think Janelle Perry sent us an email saying that she would not be able to be here. Uh, the investment committee, uh, we had uh, Lou Ciceri, uh apply, but he also sent us an email saying that he would not be here. Um, and for the tree board appointment, um, is James Finley Shiras here? No? Okay. And for the solid waste management committee, I know that there are a number of people who are interested, and if you would uh, introduce yourself and tell us about your interest in this committee. Hello, I'm Donna Barlow Casey. Pull that down Oops. to your mouth. All right, thank you. I'm, Don just I'm Donna Barlow Casey. I have spent a fair amount of time in public service over three decades. I um, have not worked in solid waste in directly in about um, six years, but I um, originally moved here in 1995 to be the executive director of the Central Vermont Solid Waste Management District. I authored the first um, zero waste plan east of the Mississippi for sustainable materials management, advocated for the state's universal recycling law, I'm an avid composter, remain a consultant on a national level to um, EgoCycle out of Boulder, Colorado on sustainable materials management. And I find myself as the current executive director for the Natural Resources Board Act 250, which um, for the first time in my life, I don't have to work night meetings, um, <laughs> I'm going day long. But um, so I have this opportunity to take um, and throw my hat in the ring to do something I'm passionate about for the city of Montpelier. I'm no longer a resident, but I spent over 20 years living here. Um, I have worked on an interim basis for the city of Montpelier at a, a few years ago. Um, I just love the city as our capital city and would um, be very, feel very privileged if you would consider my uh, candidacy for the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Alan Cheney. I uh, represent Montpelier on the Central Vermont Solid Waste Management District Board. Uh, it's an elected position. This body elected me. Um, Beyond that, I am incredibly passionate about garbage, as some of you know. <laughs> uh, I know a lot about what happens to garbage and recycling and compost uh, in central Vermont. Uh, I'm a 16-year resident and very committed to making sure that our environment and our community uh, is healthy and that our waste is disposed of properly. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kurt Erickson of uh, Vine Street. Um, I am the general manager of Vermont Compost Company. I also do work with the Food Cycle Coalition, uh, which is associated with Vermont Farm to Plate, also a member of the Composting Association of Vermont. I'm a formal environmental regulator with the U.S. Coast Guard. Um, I've been here in Montpelier for two years now, and just as I, you know, think, I'm starting to think about, um, you know, starting a family and buying a house, I just want to ensure that managing these materials in the in the best way possible thank you thank you and I'm back up at Shane and Casper Kent Street um, I work with Toxics Action Center we work side by side with community groups that are fighting pollution threats in their neighborhoods and we work with um, a number of different community groups around New England that are fighting landfills and incinerators in their communities and so every day I see kind of the the how this um, how, how our waste system, uh, you know, harms those in, you know, who, are, who are facing the brunt of it. And so um, as part of our work, we're also moving towards zero waste, um, universal recycling. And so I've just been part of a lot of these conversations at the state level and then been helping community groups at the local level. And so I really, I'm really excited to see if I can help my own community move towards uh, universal recycling and zero waste um, to, to move away from our polluting landfills. Thanks. Thank you. 
Okay, so I think that is everyone. Did, were there any questions for anybody? Okay, so do we have a motion to go into executive session? I would move that we go into executive session pursuant to 1 BSA section 313134, some 313 <laughs> blank, um, <laughs> to discuss the appointments of uh, people to city commissions. Great. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, we will be right back. Uh, okay, uh, do we have a motion to come out of executive session? So moved. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Who seconded that? Oh, did anybody second that? I tried to, but you were too quick. Oh, okay. Well, we'll <laughs> sorry. Second. Good. Thank you. <laughs> right. Okay. Find oil machine. Exactly. Now uh, I have a motion. Yep. Great. I move that we appoint James Finley Sherris to the tree board, Lou Cecere to the investment committee, Shana Casper and Janelle Perry to the Social Justice Committee, and Ellen Cheney to the Solid Waste Management Committee. Is there a second? Second. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, okay, I just want to make a note about the Solid Waste Committee. Um, I am very likely to be the one that's going to be convening that group, and I, uh, to all of the, you who applied, I want you all there. It is a public meeting, um, and uh, we uh, appointed one person because uh, this is jointly held with Barry, and they appointed one person, so we felt there needed to be some equity there. But I want your brains there. Um, so I have your email addresses, and I'll let you all know when that's happening. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, so there is a proposal uh, regarding the layout of the farmer's market for the summer. Is there um, somebody coming to talk to us about that? I think they're on the way. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, do you need more chairs? We can pull more over. <laughs> Welcome. Um, so would you would you mind uh, just going around and introducing yourselves? Sure. Okay. Uh, Hannah Blackmer, president for the Farmer's Market. Amy McCrellis, uh, Montpelier resident and community board member on the Farmer's Market Board. I'm Jess Turner. I own Capital Kitchen on State Street. Uh, my name's Eric Figglestone. I'm uh, owner of Capital Stationers on Main. Uh, Bob Watson, Capital Grounds. Uh, I'm Karen Wiseman. I'm the former president of the Farmer's Market, and I am the liaison to the board for the market meeting. And I'm Dan Grover, Executive Director of Pump Hill Your Life. Well, welcome. Uh, I think I'll go ahead and present. Um, so we're here um, asking for the council to allow us to move on to State Street and the Heaney Lot for the duration of the outdoor 2019 farmers market. Um, oh, last year we had some challenges, um, and we sort of looked at them as opportunities and we're actually pretty grateful for what happened because we think um, out the other end here, you can see everybody's at the table. Um, <laughs> and we're really grateful for that. Um, and I think that through all of our, our coordination and our discussions that we came up with a layout that's going to really work for everybody and work for our customers and the town and the city. Um, so we stepped back last year and um, we worked with the DBA and Montpelier Alive and the city and we came up with a better layout. The objective of, objectives of our layout first and foremost need to make sure we have a safe loading and unloading for the farmers. Um, we need to, an open and flowing layout that really is a customer centric experience. We need to maximize the vendors that we can have at our farmers market for our financial 
sustainability. Um, and we also really want to integrate with all of the businesses and all of the organizations that make Montpelier what it can be. Um, you know, we'll put this right out on the table. At this point in time, we really have no place to go. We did work with uh, state officials and different organizations to assess the possibility of moving to the state house lawn, which seems to be much more of a challenge than we thought. <laughs> um, so we've got a layout that we feel like is agreeable to everyone, and really the objective is to make Saturday mornings a destination in Montpelier for all the community members and surrounding community members. Um, our current open issues are uh, additional trash removal on Saturday mornings, which um, we've worked with the city and most of these are all going to be addressed already. Uh, barriers, uh, last year we needed to uh, purchase some pretty expensive barriers to shut down the street and that was a bit of a challenge for us. Uh, we'll be using our trucks and uh, that will also provide extra safety so that um, nothing like has happened in other places might happen here. Um, Bathrooms are still an open issue. We've heard um, pretty clearly from the from the businesses that um, it's something we need to address. Uh, we have some ideas, and we're still working with Sue in the city, and um, we're we're pretty confident that we can solve those. But that is definitely a concern for all of us. Um, parking. Everybody has always uh, concerned about parking. This first year. Um, we're going to all work together with a lot of advertising and pointing people to different places that they can park in the city. In future years, we're going to look towards the city council to potentially allow free parking in the new parking garage for Saturday mornings. Um, we would ask that there are no permanent vendors allowed between Main Street and Elm Street during farmer's market times. Um, and we also are still looking for a location for our trailer and, and some of other things. That's one of the um, unresolved issues, but there are some ideas and we're working with the city. Um, we've already got some regular meetings scheduled with uh, Montpelier Live and the Downtown Business Association to keep not only just communication to work through any issues, but also to really create, create reasons for people that want, for people to come downtown and visit on Saturday mornings. Um, yeah, and I just want to hand it over to Hannah to, to say a couple of things. Um, so the farmer's market has a 40 year or so tradition downtown Montpelier, um, and it's such a rich agricultural community that we're supporting um, in a rich agricultural state. And um, we really look forward to working with Montpelier as a, as a collective um, to continue those traditions and to really support those traditions um, and to continue to foster that um, that leading edge that um, our state has in the agricultural community um, nationally, really. Um, so we look at it as a really fantastic opportunity for so many people to be involved with. Great. Well, I'm so thrilled that you all uh, come together and um, have a plan that you're um, supporting. It's wonderful. Um, so I. If there's any questions from the council, um, now's the time, and then we can keep going. Yeah. I just have one clarifying question. I noticed a note on here about the on-street vendors dropping from 30, to 35 from 50. That's not total vendors, right? The other, those other vendors will still be there. They're just on the in the Heaney lot area, right? So we're same size market, just broken up into two areas. Yeah, with the Heaney lot, it actually with the Heaney lot, it actually allows us to grow in vendors, which is a, a requirement for our financial stability. Mm -hmm. We did drop down on State Street for a number of different reasons. It, it opens up the flow. It uh, decongests some of the vendors right around where a fair amount of businesses are. And um, at the same time, it allows us also to keep the market contiguous, which was a challenge with our members as well. So overall, we'll be able to grow the market up towards about 75 vendors of free cash. Okay, so I, um, any other questions? So I think we need a motion regarding the layout. Is there, or is there any public comment? I, I'll just say yeah, that I was one of the people who stood up here last spring and took issue with the layout at the time, but this layout, it seems so mindful of all the concerns that we, um, that we brought up. I mean, literally 
every concern that we brought up seems to be addressed in the new layout. So I know I'll speak for myself and a lot of State Street businesses are really looking forward to this collaboration and moving forward in a really positive, exciting way with the market. Great. Uh, Don. And oh. I'd like to oh. echo that as well. Um, it seemed like before it was not going anywhere. Um, I give credit to the farmer's market for uh, holding out and coming back and working together with uh, the merchants and I think it's a, a, a good situation. We do not want to lose the farmer's market in Montpelier. It's part of our identity and um, we welcome, um, welcome them to State Street and uh, we definitely want to keep them here in town. So. Great. Super. Uh, Donna. I just wanted to make a motion yep. that we accept the layout as presented. Do I have to refer to this map? No, as presented, I think works. Okay. Right? Second. Far farmer's market, do you need dates? Uh, During the normal farmer's market season. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> do we need yes. to specifically mention closing State Street or do anything in our motion about that? Um, I would imagine we'd probably take that up separately along with yeah, other we'd have to do a street we'll do closer. Street okay. closer. Okay. We'll, we'll do that later. Closer. So. Okay. But this was just about the layout, but I think, so. Implied that we will approve a street closure. Yeah. More than this. <laughs> right, right. Much improved. <laughs> Keep it in mind. We didn't tell you that part, right? <laughs> uh, okay, so there was a motion and a second. Any further questions or comments? Okay. I just have a comment. Uh, I think that this is too small a town to have these two important segments of the community fighting with each other, and so I'm glad you were able to do this. Great. I just want to add on that comment. Um, one thing that got me, I guess, excited and um, I'm looking forward to this is it's not, I don't think we're looking at um, putting the farmer's market on State Street. We're looking at re doing something different with State Street on Saturdays and incorporating the farmer's market with it. I think it has great potential. Yes. Um, and, you know, we'll see what happens. It's, we're all very excited for it. Great. It's very exciting. As a Montpelier resident, I'm really excited about it. <laughs> okay, any further comments? Question? All right. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, great. Thank you for all of your hard work to make this happen. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, and now we have a presentation from the Washington County State's Sorry. Attorney, uh, Roy Tebow, who I think I saw here. I also should disclose, I am employed as a deputy state's attorney in the Washington County State's Attorney's Office, so I'm not going to ask any questions or anything like that, and I just want everybody who is watching to know that as well. Great. Welcome. Basically, yes. <laughs> you might have to skip a hand out, Ashley. Oh, I think we had a staff meeting the other day. <laughs> All right, well, good evening, and thank you very much for taking time uh, to have me here this evening. It's exciting to be in front of uh, the City Council, and uh, the work you do here uh, is really important uh, because all work in government is uh, important these days. So what I really wanted to highlight to you uh, tonight are um, what you're being handed out is actually a two-year uh, operating plan for my office. Uh, it's not something that has been done in the past, and um, Many of you know I walked into this job sort of unexpectedly, uh, and the past year has been filling out uh, a different term. So I won election in November, and I have a four-year term ahead. Uh, in so uh, in any event, it's a, it's a great opportunity to have four years ahead to plan. Uh, the past year has been a lot of uh, mending fences and uh, resolving issues. Uh, Ashley, I'm sure, has probably vented to you about that in private. Uh, but looking ahead, I think it's incredibly important that uh, we recognize that Washington County, including Montpelier, has a lot of justices in the criminal challenge end. Uh, these, justi these justice challenges often overlap with uh, things that we're well versed in, economic insecurity, poverty, addiction. Uh, so rather than just sit back and respond and react to things, as we often do in the criminal justice system, I thought it was appropriate that uh, my team and I get together and think about what we really want to do and what we want to accomplish and focus on in the next two years. I think it goes without saying that the drug epidemic in Central Vermont, which also touches uh, Montpelier um, to a large extent, uh, perhaps maybe not even as much as people recognize, but it is there. 
uh, it's important to recognize that the drug epidemic uh, is a priority. Uh, I can say, unfortunately, within the last 30 days in Washington County, there have been four fatal overdose events. Uh, what's also troubling is that in three of those four cases, these are individuals who had already received and had been part of medically assisted treatment. What this means for us, uh, and I'm getting a little off script here, but I think it's important to note this, we cannot simply silo the public health response from the criminal justice response. Uh, oftentimes, the criminal justice system becomes a opportunity of last resort to save somebody or put them on the right path. Um, internal in this document, I lay out some of our, our four prongs, but they really of what our lines of effort are uh, to do a better job of justice and public safety in central Vermont and specifically Washington County. When we look at uh, addiction, there's two important things to consider uh, its response. There's an enforcement end and then there's a recovery end. Uh, those two can work well together and one of the key things that we would like to do from our standpoint of using the justice system is to reduce the overall demand for drugs in Washington County and Central Vermont. That's really a lot easier said than actually done, as you can imagine. Uh, but a part of that is making sure that we uh, strike when the iron is hot, that there's a rapid response when someone is in dealing with addiction or crisis. That means robust utilization of the TAMRAC program, which is a pretrial uh, diversion program that includes a contract for seeking substance abuse and some case management. And then when we get to more intense cases, uh, utilizing the Washington County Adult Treatment Court. Uh, another effort I'm excited to announce uh, with you uh, into we're working on with the team is extending that into the juvenile division as well so that people who are qualified to be treated as youthful offender, that is our 18 to 22 year old cohort group, uh, can access that service, uh, of course in that setting, confidential as opposed to the adult court which is held in open session. All this being said, there's a lot of uh, exciting things that we're working on. Um, what I've handed you includes, the first uh, slide is some trends. Uh, one thing I want to point out is that we had last year, 351 more cases filed in adult criminal court than we did the year before. That's out of a little over, you know, somewhere over 1,700 total. Uh, Percentage-wise, that's a pretty massive increase. That, to this point, has been buffered without any increase in staffing or resources in my office. Uh, it's nothing short of a Herculean effort of both our partners in law enforcement and the deputies there that uh, I think they've done well and we continue to uh, meet the needs uh, in the justice system. There are some alarming trends there. Uh, we have an increase in domestic violence offenses. We have a significant increase in violations of conditions of release, um, partially, likely partially attributed to some bail reform where bail is being used less often and we're relying on those conditions of release. Uh, I will note, uh, I don't have specific stats from Montpelier, but I would say anecdotally there was an increase in the number of VCRs that officers had to respond to and file. And uh, Barry City was able to attribute most of their case uh, increase to um, violations of conditions of release while their felony and violent crime rate actually decreased. So there are some things to consider. Uh, we also dealt with as an office the increase of availability of youthful offender, uh, which is a program that I'm proud to say our office is a statewide leader in. Uh, out of, I think, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 133 total filings in the state, 44 of those youthful offender petitions were in Washington County. Our office is supporting all but 11 of those dockets for treatment as youthful offender, that pertains to six individuals. You may ask, why is the state's attorney opposed to some youthful offender cases? Well, these are violent cases that affect people uh, and have real victims. They are attempted murders, they're sexual assaults, some on campuses, some in schools, uh, some in the community, and uh, also one case I'll highlight, which is a Montpelier case. There's a case that we have filed an objection to that involves the uh, sale and distribution of heroin uh, in Montpelier uh, by an 18 to 22 year old. My objection in that matter is premised on the fact that that is distribution that's occurring to youth in this community and youth in central Vermont. Uh, the response from uh, treatment in juvenile division probably isn't appropriate for long term uh, supervision. Uh, so there, there's some legislative priorities in here mapped out and one area I'm particularly concerned about is uh, issues of violent crime or serious felony crime. Uh, at this point, I would not assess that the resources available through the Youthful Offender Program are adequate to meet that. And that is a real public safety challenge for law enforcement and for my office. Uh, in some respects, I don't think, you know, not just that case, but in some ways, um, criminal justice reform is, in general, an incredibly important principle and a huge priority, not just for my office, but for the Attorney General's office and for many leaders statewide. 
but we always need to be cognizant of how those changes progress and whether the resources and supports we assume that will be there for people in that process are keeping pace is a question that we must focus on. Um, so that is really what I wanted to say by way of uh, introduction. Um, I understand all of you have different you know, um, priorities and questions probably about your community in particular or some of the things we're doing, and I'd, I'd definitely like to answer some questions or assist you in understanding what our office is doing. Uh, questions? Um, I have a, a question. Um, the, this crew will know that I have a particular love for data, and so is there a place where you all um, have data about Washington County available, or is that the kind of thing that you would that you would even want to publish? So we do have some data available. It's principally things that we are either obligated to report to the executive director's office or are reporting as part of grants. For example, we do maintain data on domestic violence trends. So that's domestic violence offenses, violation of abuse prevention orders, and violations of conditions released in those dockets. Uh, what I can tell, I can't remember the number offhand today. What I can tell you is that in 2018, we exceeded our number of filings uh, that we had in 2017 in mid-October mm -hmm. uh, and ended uh, probably about 20 to 30 cases above where we were the year before. Uh, now that said, that is, the question always becomes, is more cases mean there's more crime? And the answer is always more complicated because that can also be an indication of more reporting and more follow through. Uh, there are times where law enforcement is called to a household. Uh, you'll see in reports or what's published in the newspaper responded to a family fight, for example. Uh, sometimes a family fight is a nice way of saying this is a domestic where no one wanted to make a criminal complaint or report. Um, that's not always the case. Uh, and also follow through in case is important. The number of filings is somewhat insignificant when you look at was there a successful outcome uh, one way or the other. Okay, fair enough. Other Questions? All right. Um, maybe, forgive my ignorance here. I guess I, I do have one other question. Um, is it safe to assume that you are uh, funded through the state? We are state funded. Okay. Uh, so we're, the state's attorney's office is a very odd uh, duck when it comes to uh, state entities or county entities. So county government doesn't really exist much beyond having uh, superior court assigned to a county, a sheriff's office, and then a state's attorney's office. Uh, so employees of my office are not actually considered state employees. We are considered county or municipal employees and have somewhat different sets of, of rules that apply, different pay scale. Uh, one positive I can report on uh, is we are, you'll note in there, there's a lineup of our uh, future staffing. Um, this past legislative session, three additional deputy state's attorney positions were uh, authorized statewide. Uh, there have been a request for more, and a number of counties also experienced what Washington County did this past year of significant increases in uh, case filings and volume, uh, Franklin County being one in particular. Uh, we were lucky to be the third and final office uh, to obtain that help, and so we'll be very happy to greet a gentleman named Malachi Brennan to our office in uh, March of 2019. Um, so that's great news for us uh, in terms of that, but we are a county entity. Um, okay. The final thing I'll say as well, with the absence of county government, a lot of people look for leadership in the county. Uh, Montpelier is a very strong city. Barry City is also a very strong city with robust political discourse and a city council that's very active. Uh, that's a benefit for our more populated towns, but as the uh, chief law enforcement officer for the entire county, we have some communities that are really small and really far from law enforcement resources. One of the other areas that I hope to emphasize, uh, and I'm happy that both the Barry Community Justice Center and Montpelier Community Justice Center do serve communities outside of their immediate area, and so we have countywide coverage of that service. But in the future, uh, in the absence of a you know, county administrator, it's incredibly important that we marshal our collective community resources to help people in need and assist in the justice system. So I applaud you for your work and your cognizance of both social justice and criminal justice. Great. Thank you. Uh, Donna. Yeah. Just had a couple of questions. Thank you for the handout. Given that you just got it, the way you have it laid out, 
makes facts jump out at you, so I appreciate that. I do want to ask about the cows on front. Yes. Is that to get our attention, or do you have cows in the office? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, that's way better than a cat or a dog. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're all tagged. I think we're going to have an that. office vote tomorrow. <laughs> so I, uh, I reside in the wonderful town of Cabot, and uh, wow. those cows live up the road from me. They're very friendly cows. They are very photogenic cows. Um, and I thought that it captures our kind of rural uh, aesthetic. And certainly for someone not from here, when you think Vermont, you think maple syrup and cows. Okay. Well, likewise, you have three words here, fair, transparent, and responsive. What are three ways that things could change in your office to make it more fair, more transparent, and more responsive? So fairness is an important concept. And you will see in there, there's a number of values that I've uh, put out actually right after my appointment. I thought it was important to have a, sort of a turning of the page and a change in perspective of how we approach criminal justice problems. Um, I think fairness implies a lot of things. We're looking ultimately at what's best for the community. It's not necessarily what, in every case, a victim wants. It's not necessarily always that you know, an offender probably doesn't want to go to jail or do you know, some of the things we ask them to do. What we're looking at is reducing risk in the community and arriving at outcomes that make sense and you know, are hopefully pro-social and are changing behavior. Uh, usually when we have people in the criminal justice system, they're at rock bottom. Nobody wants to be sitting there on a arraignment day. As nobody wants to be coming out of the back in handcuffs because of something they've done. Um, that's an opportunity, though. It's an opportunity for some sort of positive change. Uh, we've seen people in the most dire straits of addiction really have an incredible recovery, be it through treatment court or through probation, or just the fact that this is a wake-up call that gets them to go seek help or that gets their family engaged and realize that this isn't just a problem that they can ignore at family dinner or at gatherings. So in that sense, fairness, fairness is a evolving concept, and it depends on what you're looking at and who you're dealing with. Fair means assessing facts and making sure that he, we, as prosecutors, don't just think about what is popular in the newspaper or what's popular in the community. It's about doing what's right, even when that right may be really difficult to do. In terms of um, transparency, um, you know, I try, in my sense, to be very open and communicative with community partners, stakeholders, and with constituents when they call in or concern. Um, you know, I Ashley can attest there are times where people don't like what we're doing one way or the other and we get yelled at or, you know, people, other times people come up to us and are very happy about something in the street. So transparency, I think, is maintaining open communication and not obscuring what we're doing or why we're doing certain things. Um, you know, for those, uh, we brought up youthful offender before. I have not been shy about my opinions about where the youthful offender law needs help or where we need more state resources to make some of these things work. So I think in that sense, transparency is just keeping that dialogue alive. Now, I will say as a caveat, you know, uh, I know the mayor likes numbers. Numbers can be difficult, uh, and I'll be <laughs> blunt. My office is not yeah. equipped to have someone uh, sit there, collect statistics. So when we, do, when we have a mandate to do it, we do it. To be that proactive is difficult because that means I'm taking an Ashley Hill or my DV prosecutor, Tracy Leibowitz, I'm taking them off of casework to sit there and, and collect data. And uh, that's a luxury I have some time, but it's a luxury that uh, no one else really has right now. I can't remember the third word offhand. Responsive. But you Responsive. sort of answered so, by the first two, sure. so that's okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Are you getting the support and everything you need from city services? Um, you know, our police department, Justice Center, me, anybody is, you know, I, sure. here in Montpelier, you know, you talked a lot about the county, but we're, we're obviously worried about Montpelier, so we want to make sure you're getting what you need. You have to put me on the spot with the chief sitting yeah. there. Yeah. So. <laughs> you can make him leave the room. No. <laughs> no, I think that, uh, you know, from the from a law enforcement perspective, you have a lot to be proud of in Montpelier. Uh, you have excellent leadership. You have really dedicated professionals at both the sergeant level who are supervising and at the road level. Um, you know. I think a lot of departments strive to be this responsive community force and, you know, some talk the talk. Montpelier walks the walk and um, I think that that's a benefit of being a well-resourced department with a really professional staff and by and large, I have to say, we are really truly blessed to have incredibly responsive, fair and transparent law enforcement in Washington County. Uh, it's not without hiccups or without issues that come up. but. Um, really fortunate. The Montpelier PD in particular um, 
really is a professional department. The quality of work is incredibly high. And I know uh, many of you in the city council are probably aware of a string of burglaries that took place at the end of last year and some other you know, more high profile crimes. Those have been investigated well. They are complex crime. Very seldom on a complex case do I ever have to call back and ask for more here. And that, to me, is the world. And that means that we get better outcomes and faster outcomes. Thank you. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. OK. So we are up to all the town meeting day stuff. So the first thing is to set the date for the annual city meeting, um, town meeting day. Tuesday, March 5th, 2019, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., City Hall Auditorium. I don't think this is controversial. I was going to make that motion, but you just stated everything I needed to say. Do I have to restate it for you the secretary? Say, what, you know, say second. M you you, you say can move, yes. I'm looking at say the so order. So, so you can just say so, so moved. moved. So OK, so moved. Great. Second. Further discussion? Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? OK. Uh, on to the budget. So I was just going to go quickly through. Yeah. Yeah. Do you need to open the hearing? Yes, I believe I do. Uh, so I'm going to officially open the second public hearing on uh, budget. And Bill is going to run through some basics, and then we'll talk. Okay. Yeah, I'm just going to take a second for everything to fire up. Take a quick break if you want. Uh, you want that's on. That's on. Like that. Okay. It's like back we'll work on, that's on that's dimmers. <laughs> for next year, we'll have dimmers, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> every other every other slide. Okay. Um, this is similar to what you've seen. Uh, this is updated from your decisions based on uh, at the last meeting, and obviously this is the second and final public hearing on the city's budget and our, our budget proposals. After this, you'll make a decision about what to place on the ballot. Um, again, our budget was set up to implement our strategic plan to um, continue our capital uh, plan and to, to deliver responsible services. Uh, going through the strategic plan, our, one of our goals was community prosperity. We've funded the Montpelier Development Corporation. We've kept our planning staff with our, our new zoning and master plan being developed and implementing our new TIF, TIF district. Uh, for environmental stewardship, we've uh, kept the $5,000 for the Energy Committee. We've added one new parks and tree position. We have uh, funded our stormwater projects. We've included the GMT circulator bus that was discussed earlier tonight and uh, considered having an, uh, funding an energy planning grant to, to do an energy master plan. For our inclusive, equitable, and welcoming community, we've increased funding for our community fund. We've got new Arts Commission funding. We've kept our feast program for uh, at the senior center. We've increased funding for Montpelier Alive and uh, kept our funding for our community enhancements. For sustainable infrastructure, we've increased our capital improvement and equipment plan by $25,000. We've followed our water and sewer plan. We've added a facilities and sustainability director to be uh, added in October. And we've kept our complete streets plan with some funding thoughtfully built uh, environment. We've included, again, the Downtown Improvement District and funding for downtown projects in our uh, plan. And of course, our big project for the year presumably would be the uh, parking structure. Uh, for more housing, we added $50,000 to our housing trust fund, bringing up to $110,000. We've and, and we've implemented our TIF, which I mentioned earlier, which calls for more housing. Public health and safety, we just discussed this with the state's attorney. We've added a new police officer. 
We've budgeted for public events that we expect will happen. We've continued flooding, uh, counting, uh, excuse me, funding our flood gauges, which uh, have been very helpful, particularly over uh, the holidays. We had a uh, flash jam up, and it was the gauges that caught it and allowed us to provide early notification to people that uh, we might have some flooding conditions. So uh, they've they continually prove their worth. They're also available for the public to look at on their own. We continue expanding our paramedic program as we hire new people at our fire and EMS department. And we've continued pro Project Safe Catch as we share the state's attorney's goal to fight the op opioid crisis. So Bill, can I ask a question about the uh, EMT of, of the uh, paramedic program? Yes. Is that a program whereby as we hire uh, new staff in the fire department, we're looking to have them be <coughs> certified at the uh, paramedic level rather rather than just the EMT level? That, that's correct. We, uh, Bob's in the back. He'll correct me if I get the number wrong, but I think we have three now. Is he nodding? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I, can't, I can't see. Three, three now, two existing employees in training. Our, our, our long-term goal over a many-year period is, you know, have, have the whole staff uh, as paramedics, but that's a, that's a long way coming. They, they cost more. There's a lot of training and equipment involved and all that kind of thing. On the other hand, you can provide much greater services. You can charge more for the services. Um, so at this point, we're doing it on an incremental basis, but once those two complete, there'll be five out of the, the fifth, sorry, well, there's 16 counting Bob, but uh, of the 15 that are really on the calls, it'll be a third of our, our staff. So that's a, you know, considering a couple years ago, we didn't have any. So we're, we're moving. It's, a, it's been an issue. You're welcome. For our responsive and uh, responsible government, we are continuing our communications efforts, our employee wellness efforts, our service levels are all maintained. We didn't have any reductions in service in this year's budget, which is great. Continuing our bridge article, our new Invisio software is working well. We have the public dashboard for people to see at any time. And we are developing, uh, as you've heard me mention, our program Access Montpelier, which we'll hear more about uh, later this year. And we're hoping we'll to set aside reserve funds for a citizen survey, our strategic planning effort, and the energy planning. So, so in, in uh, real specific numbers, the budget changes right now that are that we council approved at the last meeting. We're increasing the capital funding by twenty-five thousand, a new police officer position, a new parks and trees position, a new facilities director position, increasing the housing trust fund a new Arts Commission funding, increasing Montpelier Alive, increasing the Community Fund, a new Child Care for Meetings, and the one-time funding. So otherwise, I mean, everything else was basically held at its same levels given inflation and employee costs, et cetera. Taking a look at our budget, where it comes from, uh, about two-thirds of it is from the property taxes, the rest from various other sources. And as we look at how we spend it, this is a, a chart. This will be in the annual report as well, but just showing by uh, department where our, our money goes. No big surprise, our, our, our big money goes to police, fire, and public works. Those are our major services and, and the capital, uh, capital services, capital plan, excuse me. Uh, so the, the money to do the projects and the, keep the equipment and then the, the personnel to, to do the work. Uh, as we look at our budget, as you can see, over, we're over 50% personnel funded. That is how municipal government works um, and uh, divides out this way. If we look at all the different services and take a look at uh, the average tax bill, um, this is a chart. It's a little hard to read up here. It will be in the annual report, but it just gives you a snapshot of what you pay for, on average, for an individual service. And again, it's pretty clear. Almost half goes to police, fire, and public works. Um, and uh, so, uh, our municipal rates. The for the municipal budget, the property tax rate would, is scheduled to go up 3.7 cents or 3.4 percent uh, for an average tax bill increase of $85. The district heat rates were recently approved and are being implemented. The water and sewer is estimated to go up 3.5% as per our, our capital plan, and there would be no change for our sewer benefit or CSO benefit. Taking a look overall, we just got numbers from the school department. Their budget is scheduled to go up. Um, their residential budget will go up 4.5 cents, or about 2.8%, which means overall, uh, at the bottom in highlight, the, the overall tax rate will go up 8 cents, or about 3% from uh, the prior year. 
and that shows, as you can see, this is about 108. That all totals to about $186 for the average uh, homeowner, and this is the breakout of the. Uh, so what portion goes for what? It's about 58% for schools, about 38% for the city, 3% for sewer CSO, 1% for the ballot items. So that's a breakout. So that's the. The, the fast tour through the budget. Happy to answer any questions, of course. Many department heads are here. Today is our final public hearing. Um, early voting will start in mid-February. The actual voting day, as you just said, was uh, March 5th from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. I had a constituent inquiry uh, today about one of the uh, personnel items, but I think it applies to everything. When we have... Uh, when we're showing a, <clears throat> a new position we're creating and there's a dollar value associated to that, is, is that salary plus uh, yes. fringes all, and, all in. and everything? All, all costs. In. Okay, thank you. So at this point, um, if the council has more clarifying questions, um, we'll do that. And then I'd like to open it up to the public for public comments. And then we'll um, continue on with more substantive discussion um, with the council. Uh, so any clarifying questions? Yes. Um, Which I can take from my seat once I turn this. On. So, so this is. Uh, oh, do you want me to put the spreadsheet up? Actually, that would be helpful for my question. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so while you're getting it up, I'll, I'll ask it. Uh, the the additional parks position, not the tree management, but the additional parks position, has been discussed as. Sixty-five thousand. It's fifty-five. We had it on the 55. spreadsheet. It is fifty-five. So I just Correct. wanted to clarify which number it is. The the number that we worked with in the budget was fifty-five thousand. I've lately seen a different number, but the number we had was fifty-five. Though. Okay, so fifty-five is is our number. Right. Thank you. Any further clarifying questions? Okay, comments from the public on the budget. If you'd introduce yourself and tell us. Where you live? Hello, I'm Nancy Chickering. I live right here in Montpelier, up on Core Street, the very top of that Cliff Street Hill. Um, so I'm really close to the park, and I'm interested in that in that comment you just made because I'm here also just to get clarification in terms of parks and trees. I I love how we're trying to merge and carry things under bigger umbrellas. My understanding, and I may be wrong, and I'm glad to see Jeff here because he might help clarify this for me. My understanding with the Emerald Ash Borer is a lot of good conversation went on about how we can be proactive about not being like some other communities further south, not taking, you know, stepping in and, and dealing with that proactively. My understanding is that parks and tree position is really a tree position and not so much supporting the park and all the expansion that I would like to see them do. So I just thought I would put a plug in to see. I've been next door neighbors to the park for 25 years, and I worry about the sustainability with Jeff, who I've watched for you know, two plus decades. They work, and Alec is right there like Jeff. They work, it's not a 40 hour a week job. <laughs> they plow at six, they're there seven days a week. They just, they over, over, overdo, and it's amazing, and it, it um, it shows in the community. They have, you know, volunteers, global volunteers. They have churches putting them up and people volunteering their canoes and their chainsaws and their, uh, you know, work parties. Um, and I just think it's amazing what they do with their budget. And it's amazing what the city has done to prioritize that. And I love that Bill's first two slides had community prosperity and then environmental stewardship. And I just think the park and the extension of trails now into North Branch it's just so much about what makes Montpelier an absolutely amazing place to live. And it's one of the things that lets us see that we're growing the 20 and 30 and 40 year old people that I think we really need to be calling into this community if we want this community to be sustainable. That kind of recreation is critical. Um, and I'm just blown away with what I've seen um, that park do for the last 25 years. So that's my plug for the park and hoping that that money is really supporting the park and not just supporting emerald ash borer and tree stuff that I think is also really, really important. 
So just to clarify, um, the uh, additional position that was added that, that you saw listed there um, really was about trees. Um, specifically, um, we may discuss a little later uh, a separate position potentially um, that would be more related to parks. So I, I'll jump that, in on that, that too. Fair? No, that's fair. Yeah. And the, so initially, there were two positions proposed, one just for trees, one just for parks. And I think in the, in, as we went through, both as a staff to recommend a budget, which we recommended the one position, and the council came in with this, um, currently we split the parks and trees amongst the existing employees. I, hate to, I don't like having my back to everybody, but um, we split the parks and trees with the existing employees, and we we get that there's maybe a, a bigger demand, but you know, all of our departments have demands, and we're trying to we're trying to balance that. Um, so the feeling is that you know there's probably it didn't seem like there would be tree work, you know, 40 hours a week, 52 weeks a year, and that the the efforts could be shared, and and that a, one person with trees is going to need help from parks employees anyway. And the thought was, let's try this for a year, see how it goes. We're going to have new leadership there, see uh, what changes and what demands there are, and then reconsider the, the other staffing position after we've had a chance. We wasn't necessarily this would never be. Um, so uh, from my perspective, and I, I can't speak for the council, it wasn't as black and white as this is trees only and this is parks only. They really are a blended group. Right now, the two of them do both. So. Hi, Dan Dickerson from the Parks Commission. Um, I wanted to come up and, and also make one final push um, for um, the new parks position. And I, and I guess I wanted to expand a little bit, or at least talk a little bit about what the this new trees position, um, or parks and trees, however you want to frame it, uh, what it provides, but where um, it actually could create some limitations. And so what it provides, I think it provides the, the city uh, the ability to sort of think um, strategically about how to address emerald ash borer in our street trees, in our parks, and, and throughout the community. Um, but where, when it really comes down to doing the groundwork, so going out and, and addressing the huge you know, tree care backlog that we have, and also you know, dealing with emerald ash borer, you can't do that with one person. And, and so, you know, the city could say, well, all right, we'll contract with, you know, a firm to, to do some of this work or take another route. But, you know, if we, if we want trees or if we want city staff to be taking care of the trees, um, you need to have more people doing that. And so what happens is, you know, if we have this tree person that's going to go out and care for the street trees, um, you know, we're going to end up pulling a parks person to help on that or potentially both parks people to help on that and that leaves the parks empty. Um, and so, you know, and, and I don't want to say that, I mean, this, this tree's position is very important. I think it's going to allow the city to do great things. But I think, you know, really, in order to address the, the backlog in trees maintenance and parks maintenance, we really need two positions. So that way we could have at least a two-person crew um, doing tree work, and we could always have a two-person crew doing park work. And, and it would allow us to get more done, both on the trees front and the parks front. Um, I know, you know, I know it's a cost increase and, and ultimately it's a tax increase, but given that the parks and trees are currently 2.4% of the city budget and, and I'm paying $50 a year, um, I think it's pretty reasonable to, to request this position and, and, you know, maybe there are some residents that would be um, you know, unwilling to, to take on that tax increase, but I think given the use that our parks receive, and given that, you know, on top of the other benefits of having this new position, we could also increase staff presence within the park to maybe educate people on, on canine care and, and bikes, so that way it reduces some of the consternation on Front Porch Forum. Um, you know, there are just a, a lot of ways that this position would benefit the city, and so I really strongly encourage the City Council to approve the, the funding for the position. And sorry I've gone too long. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't get to great bread yet. <laughs> Hi, my name is Kasha Ranjo. I am also on the Parks Commission. I'm on North Park Drive, and uh, this is Celeste. <laughs> and um, my 
like many of you, uh, my family has chosen to live in Montpelier and chosen where to live in Montpelier because of our parks. And I've chosen to give back to our parks. I work in conservation as my profession. I fundraise. I've already been helping the parks address some of those needs, and I'm glad to do that. Um, and in recent years, we've invested in the expansion of our parks and the expansion of our services. There are new trails in North Branch Park. There are plans to add Confluence Park in the future. And the parks are something that draw young families like my own to come live here and stay here and invest in this community. We've invested in expanding our parks, and we have not invested in expanding the staff to run our parks. And that's a problem. And I'm hoping that you guys will consider adding an additional parks person. We've discussed the tree position. That is not a parks position. They're separate. We, if we want to invest in the future of our parks, we need to invest in the staff to keep them the way they are and make them even better for the future. Thank you. John Snell, a tree board, among other things, uh, frequenter of the parks. Uh, I appreciate the coming back here and talking and, and clarifying that the person I supported you in, in bringing on for trees is still an essential person, and that's who shows up in the budget. And we're that person's already at work. Uh, they've already made a difference. It's going to continue to make a difference in the backlog as well as in uh, dealing with the Emerald Ash Borer. Uh, I have long thought that we needed an additional parks person. And when I started to talk with Jeff about what's going on uh, with his retirement, it became very clear that when he retires, basically we're going to be down one and a half people, <laughs> not one person. And, uh, you know, I. I I've talked to Jeff about how disorganized he can be sometimes, but I also will tell you that there is nobody in this town who can pull in volunteers like that guy. It takes time, it takes time to manage them, and yet if we were to run DPW with as many volunteers as Parks does, um, we'd be in trouble. So I think that it's pretty clear to me that with, with Jeff retiring, with the expansion, not only of the size of the park, adding now a new new uh, trail along the river, uh, what, what's formerly known as the bike path, um, and, and also adding new events that have been really well received by the community uh, in the parks, uh, one of which will be next week again, that, that there's, there's just a tremendous demand for the system of parks that we have and they create an immense value. They are a pull to people to come here and live here, especially young families. Um, so I'm asking you to put the money back in for another person. I think we need that person and that that person will be well utilized uh, with our new parks director. Thank you. Thank you. ago I attended an amazing event um, and a number of you were there and it was the opening of the French block which after 80 years there will now be people living in those apartments and I think that event just speaks for itself in terms of what a small relatively small investment of community resources in that case housing trust fund can do for a city and um, I used to work as a, as a public funder of affordable housing, and I still have a lot of friends in that, in that area. And they say repeatedly that the investments that a city like Montpelier makes make all the difference in the world in, the, in a very hyper-competitive funding environment. Um, really gives us a leg up. And um, the, the money that the Housing Trust Fund invested in the French block leveraged millions of dollars, both from private investors like banks, but also public funding. So um, on behalf of the 
Task Force, we were very pleased with the level of funding that came out of the last hearing, and we would urge you to keep it that way, and we think that together we can continue to make progress on both affordability and availability of housing for people in Montpelier of all economic uh, strata. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, council, um, uh, what is your interest? What, do you like it as it is? Do you want to change anything? Where do you want to go? Go ahead, Connor. The uh, risk of being a flip flopper, I uh, supported the park's position before I opposed it. Um, <clears throat> spent a lot of time the last couple of weeks just talking to constituents, and I uh, really do believe there's an appetite for this in the community. Um, you know, the, the expansion. Um, my hang up initially was when we were talking about the part time position, was I thought this would be overwhelming to put on anybody for a part time job. And it, in effect, it would create a full time position with a part time person doing the work. So I think I'd like to propose um, putting a full time position in the budget this time around, but maybe starting six months in the fiscal year so that it would start in um, January, I believe. And uh, to be honest, I haven't done the math on it yet. Um, I, I'd like to put that on the table. And I, yeah. if it's appropriate, I'd make a motion to do it. Second. Any further thoughts on that? Oh, uh, let's go Rosie, then Ashley. So um, two concerns. Um, first, I feel like we've already done a little bit of a, a disservice and a little bit of a hiding the ball here by um, playing that same trick with the new facility director position and starting it partway through the year so that the city doesn't see the full budget impact this year, but we will be stuck with it next year unless we want to lay somebody off. Um, so I'm really uncomfortable with um, playing that game again here. Um, and I also want to say that I am, I appreciate that the council last time um, considered this uh, thoroughly and decided to make the hard decision to cut that addition. It, it's not a cut of a position because the position doesn't exist yet, but to um, not add that new position at this time. I'm very concerned that um, our tax rate is growing so much higher than the cost of living increase that many living on a fixed income um, will receive next year. Our social safety net is um, really fragile right now. Um, I'm hearing every day from folks who never would have thought that they would have needed assistance and are now finding themselves wondering where they can get assistance. And so this is not the year to play that game. Um, and this is not the year to, to increase even as much as 3.4%. I'm, I'm frankly, I'm still not feeling good there. Um, and to, you know, I, I'm sure that I'm sure that if we add this position, the budget will pass. That's not my concern. I'm not concerned that voters will vote the budget down. I'm concerned about the people who don't have a voice at the table and who are really struggling and on a fixed income and not able to get the assistance that they need. Um, so I'm very much opposed to that. I'm going to echo a lot of what Rosie said. I was just doing some math over here. And I think the minimum wage in Vermont is now like 1078 an hour. Um, and according to a, a number of sites, the the average rent for an apartment here is $950. I'm not sure where the $950 a month apartments are in Montpelier. I have not been able to find them in all of my years here. Um, and so I was, I was waiting to see what the school budget numbers would look like. Um, and it looks like the overall tax bill, as it is with this budget at the 3.42, which is too high for me even, um, you know, it's $185 extra a year. And for the folks who can absorb $185 extra per year, that's great and that's fine. And, um, you know, that increase is, is sort of not taking away anything. It's, it's maybe taking away some discretionary income or some, um, you know, some, some savings or, or something where they're not going to feel it. But doing the math out at 1078 um, an hour, that uh, assuming a 40 hour work week, that's 17. Uh, let's see, 172480 a month, and then I did a 30% reduction for taxes and you know and, and whatever else sort of comes off the top, which leaves you with 120736, and then you subtract $950, which is the average rent rate now, which gives you um, a whopping, I want to say it is, let's see, 
$257.36 left if you're working full-time on minimum wage, um, uh, uh, finding some magical unicorn apartment that I have yet to, to find in this city. Um, then when you talk about raising property taxes, even, you know, even $185 a year, I mean, that, that translates in significant ways when it comes to rental properties and things like that. And um, I would love to believe that all landlords are altruistic, but in all of the years that I've been renting, when property taxes go up, what typically happens is renters uh, do experience an increase. And I just don't see where folks who are working for minimum wage, let alone even $15 an hour in our community, are, are going to be able to absorb, uh, you know, a rent increase like that when, you know, that doesn't even include health insurance and you don't qualify, um, at least at, you know, 125% of the federal poverty guideline on a $10.78 an hour wage, let alone at a $15 an hour wage. Um, and I love a lot about Montpelier. I love our parks. I value so much the work that our employees put in. And I know every city employee puts in extra. Anyone who works in government puts in extra. I do it myself all the time. But what I cannot do is go home and, you know, when my friends and my neighbors are looking at me saying, I can't afford to live here, I have to start looking elsewhere, you know, I can't in good conscience support a budget with even a 3.42% increase. I, I'd been thinking like 2.8 to 3.2, somewhere in there. Um, but this directly impacts a lot of the people that I love and care about in our community. And I appreciate the need that Montpelier has. Um, but I also appreciate that in order to keep this a place where every single person who is already here and some of the folks that we want to move here can afford to be here, this is not sustainable. Donna. Well, I take all your comments about the budget in general, but I'm not going to hold, want to see the parks held hostage for the total objection to the amount of what we're putting in our budget. So if you want to go and open all the items, fine, but the parks really need a full-time position. And I'd like to see it full-time for a full year, but at least Connor was offering a compromise that I could go with. It's better than nothing. But I don't think the parks that is a small, small 2.4% of our budget now should be the one to suffer. If you want to go and look at all the other items, I'll go there. But I'm not going to put it on the parks to be the one not to get what they need. Other comments? Glenn. Um, I don't know if I'm going to be able to add much. Um, I'm also a flip-flopper since I supported this added position at the first uh, workshop and then uh, agreed to take it off at the, the, the first hearing. Um, I am, I continue to be conflicted about this. I think that uh, it, it seems clear to me that uh, we could very happily use more staff in parks. Uh, the Parks Commission, who are elected to, to uh, take care of a lot of that uh, have have told us that we we should um, at the same time it does make sense to me that from a, a kind of structural organizational point of view uh, we have one new employee this year working on trees we're going to be hiring a new director that new director could potentially be the best person to be directly involved in hiring another person if we need one next year. Um, I would, I think, I would love to see us hire another person for, for fiscal year 21 if we need to um, and have that conversation then. Uh, because while I hear a lot of the arguments, I'm not sure I, I quite feel the, the urgency that we need a, a new position, a new full-time position right now as opposed to next year. Um, that said, there have been some really strong arguments, and many of them, <laughs> over the last couple of weeks uh, in favor of the new parks position, and, and uh, I, I can't say I'm not swayed by those. I really appreciate the conversation. Uh, I, I still don't know I thought I would be fixed by now, and I'm not. So um, I think that's all I have to say at the moment. 
can, can Bill put some numbers in? I can't get your spreadsheet sure. you sent us to be active. It won't accept my numbers. That's right. What do you want? Uh, under the, the half position? Uh, yeah, put, I mean, yeah, the parts. 27.5. <laughs> What's well, that? so, uh, Todd, is that, would that be an accurate number for... Well, that's half of 55. But it's not right, over. but it's... Sorry, it's not I put it in benefits the place. might not make it half. Well... Or maybe, maybe it does, because if it's, if it's starting in January. Any thoughts, Todd? Well, I'll just put it here. Bill, you've got 5,000. So I don't know why it's, it's not popping uh, up. It's really 5. difficult to predict that because, depending on who we hire and whether they're on a family plan or a single plan, whether they opt out of benefits because they have coverage somewhere else to, to get the first of all, people stay on their plans until they're 26 years old, so it's much cheaper. So there's a, a sway of $20,000 essentially in the benefit mm -hmm. package just due to health insurance, uh, potentially. Can I ask you, well, since you're here, um, what if this position was contracted? That would not necessarily obligate us um, to hire the next year, but um, maybe um, sort of evaluate whether or not it was really needed but the, by the following year. Contracting is certainly possible. Uh, but you run the risk of running up with state labor laws just because you have to be, you know, it has to be truly an independent person that does the work as a mm -hmm. business, mm -hmm. has their own insurance, holds a shingle out to operate as such, um, and that we don't have control over their schedule. So um, they would be setting their own hours, we would be paying them based on, on that. So it's certainly a possibility. Um, I just want to be careful that we don't yep. just grab an individual. Yep, OK. Um, Donna, yeah. So I'm just trying to read the numbers. Is that something? My glass reading glasses aren't as good as it You mean down here? Is that 92? Yeah, this is 92. 92. Okay. 3.71. 3.7. Yeah. Okay, from 3.5. Okay. Yeah. Can I ask what the difference is with that number out of the bill from previously? It was, was 3.42 before. Right. Yeah, $7. Yeah. And, yeah. Oh, and it's a $7 difference? Yeah, $7 difference. Yeah. Uh, Rosie, just want to point out again, though, that you're making, you're forcing a future council to make, to, to take the brunt of the decision that you're making. Um, it looks like only seven dollars this year, but once we hire that person, they're a member of our community, and I can't imagine that we would be able to let them go if we decided we didn't actually need their services. Um, I, the public, even if the council made the decision, the public outcry to uh, to lay off a particular individual who worked in our parks would be insane. I mean, we wouldn't be able to do it. So once you're making the decision to put this position in, it's until that person decides that they'd like to leave. Um, Glenn, would you like a two-minute like recess? <laughs> uh, uh, I, I don't. Would, okay. Donna, would you like just a couple minute reasons? I, I practically just, on the practical aspect, I would. Yes. Okay. Um, I, uh, I I will just say there have been times when I have felt very conflicted, and I just needed like a minute to collect my thoughts, and I just want to make sure that I offer that to you yeah. if you want that. Thank you. I think I'm slower than you. Uh, I would need more than that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but since we could use a recess anyway let's, okay. yeah, let's do it uh, but Jack before we have a recess do you have a comment yeah I supported this uh, before I think that uh, the the idea that we're losing uh, expertise and a lot of overtime and having uh, Jeff retire um, was persuasive to me um, I'll also point out that uh, as all of you know, we've in the last several days we've received a tremendous volume of email from uh, residents supporting this position, and I don't truly think that we're here on the council simply to be a mouthpiece for uh, people who, uh, for the people in the community. I think that one of the things people should expect from all of us on the council is 
our judgment of, uh, on the issues that come before us, but uh, it's hard to ignore that there's, there's a lot of support for this. Now, I don't know how much 10 emails can translates to in terms of overall uh, popular support. That's a question that legislators deal with uh, all over the place, but uh, it seems like a pretty popular uh, position. So I'm not, I'm, I supported it before and I continue to support it. Um, I, so I'll just weigh in and say uh, there, there was a, a proposal, um, uh, there was this number being floated around, uh, $65,000, uh, and I believe the reason there was this discrepancy was because there was this $10,000 um, uh, potential for some additional uh, parks uh, help over the summer and uh, that was that was most interesting to me I felt like well we could do something temporary hire some people over the summer and and do um, you know a, a increase uh, you know the the parks staff that way um, when it would certainly be useful um, uh, if it, well if we, well, depending on where, where wherever we land, um, I, I'm I'm not in favor of a full time position, um, but I would entertain the half. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I'll I'll just leave it there for now, and let's take a let's take a, a two five minute. Well, five. let's go let's go with the, realistically it's going to be five minutes. Yeah. So let's go with a five minute break. Okay, we are all back, so we're going to come back from um, our recess. Uh, and so just to get things started, Bill, you have a comment about yeah, the data here. Just a piece of information. I, you know, obviously, what you decide to do, where you choose to set your priorities is, is your call. Um, but I want to make sure everyone's dealing with correct information. There was a comment made about how we had not changed the park staff. And I, I haven't had a chance to go research this, but I think I can say fairly accurately from memory. I know when I started here, it was 24 years ago. It was a, there was one quarter time position. Eventually got increased to half, three quarters, and a full time. Then we've added the second full time position that was in there. When we consolidated with, um, put together some of the community services, some of the admin services, such as booking shelters and publicity brochures, have all been picked up by admin folks that used to be done by parks. So it's not really adding people, it was taking responsibilities off. So it may well be the time that. We need additional folks, but it, it isn't totally accurate to say that we've not increased staffing over a period of time as the parks have grown. We have okay. done that. Um, I, and as well as adding the part-time tree positions. Sure, and I, I wanted to just also add, I uh, had a uh, quick conversation reminding uh, me that uh, we do uh, the, the the administration or some of the ad admin work is done by people That's what in I was the, just saying, the community, oh, the community services, services right, uh, right. That piece right. that that does that. So yeah, we okay. went from one quarter okay. position to now two full okay. plus the admin services okay. plus the. Got gotcha. you. Okay. Entry. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, anybody have any further comments? Um, yeah. Go ahead. Andrew you're sitting again from the Parks Commission. I, I did want to sort of make an attempt to address some of the concerns that Councilwoman Hill and, and Councilwoman Kruger had. You know, I, I, this position, you know, it doesn't need to be a lawyer or somebody with a physics degree. It could be somebody that's, that's coming off of substance abuse, somebody that's coming out of the, the criminal justice system that needs a new opportunity. This is somebody that would go into the parks and, and essentially do ground work, you know, uh, repairing trails, pulling invasive species, um, you know, it's good life experience for anyone, and so it, it does, you know, it, yes, there would still be people that would have to make ends meet on low incomes, but it would create an opportunity for somebody that's maybe making minimum wage now to, to move up a little bit and, and have an opportunity to really make a difference for the community. And so I, you know, it doesn't fully address your current concerns, but it, it is an opportunity for somebody that, that maybe is, is trying to move up a little bit. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, John. Just one more quick one, because I, I do hear what Bill's saying about that, that other services have been added on to the park, and, and 
yet the park has expanded and the missions of the park have expanded tremendously, especially in the last five, five years or so. And that's going to happen again with the addition of the new bike path that that'll be a park responsibility. So I think we've added in enough that it's time for another person. Uh, go ahead, Rosie. I'm just seeing Bill make a face about the bike path, and I'm just wondering if that's actually our plan. I thought it was going to be a DPW response. That's, yeah, I, I, the bike, I, well, I don't want to get in an intramural food fight with our staff. We can talk about that tomorrow <laughs> morning, but typically the bike paths are maintained with um, by DPW. I know the park does the piece about um, the Peace Park out on, on that one. Um, but I, you know, maybe they've had a discussion and have decided the parks are going to do it. So I, invasive. Invasive. Of the invasive species. Again, I don't, I'm not sure why that's the parks. Okay. Okay. If, uh, oh, do you, okay, go ahead, Glenn. Yeah. Uh, so I think I did come to something. Uh, and it may be a little awkward because what I feel like at the moment is going with my instinct, which is when somebody asks, say yes, and uh, <laughs> yeah, Bill's laughing at that. Uh, and, and I do think that uh, with, with all of the, the, the arguments that have been put forward in favor of a new parks position, I think that, that I'm I'm on board with that. And at the same time, I really think that Rosie's point about not saddling the future council with a half a position is, is sensible. So I'd actually put in the whole position at 55. Right. Um, I, I, I feel like I, I need to say something else about it, and I'm not sure what it is. But I, I think your your comment about uh, the parks being the, the target kind of of this this budget pressure at this point, I think it's kind of just because th that's how it came down to the timing. But I think that um, to me, uh, the budget number higher than cost of living increase at all. Once it's higher than cost of living increase, it's 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 higher in a way, and and beyond that, a lot of the the little adjustments, you know, an extra few dollars here or there, it, it starts to feel like we're doing a disservice to the whole process. And I I would say a whole position or not a position, um, and that's that's where I am. I would move that we put the full parks position in at 55 grand. We've got a motion oh, yes. already on the Excuse table, me. so we've got to vote on that. And then yeah. OK. You could amend it. Or, yeah. I can. All right. There we go. I amend, uh, I'll amend. i suggest an amendment that uh, we go from the half a position to full position. Is there? I'll second. Uh, OK. So. Um, I, I will just say that I, I think, um, I mean. Do we have to vote on the amendment? To yes, the first? amendment first and then the other motion. So I guess I would just add that, um, I, I mean, I, we, we all know that Jeff does a wonderful job. And he's, such, it's, uh, he's also just an X factor, right? Like, because what is the new person going to be like, right? And how is that time-wise going to work? So um, my inclination is to, uh, is to wait and not. Um, uh, not go full time at this point, uh, but uh, that, but that, that's just what I would advise. Um, so, any other further comments about this amendment? No. Okay. Um, all right. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Nay. Okay. I think that it meant that it did not pass. I think I heard enough no's there and did not pass. Okay, so we're back to the original motion of a half-time um, position. Uh, and there's a motion on the table. Any further discussion about that? Okay, um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? 
Nay. No. Okay, so I think that carries. So we're at a half, uh, half position there, but starting, uh, sure, full time, but starting in January 27. Is that? Okay, great. Okay, any other changes or are we done, team? I guess I'm just gonna um, put out there one more time. Um, you know, we've had this discussion so many times and I've lost every time, so let's just go. Oh, <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> I was gonna propose more cuts, but we've had, we, we, we know where we are. Fair enough. Um, any further comments? Uh, I think we, what do we need to do at this point? Do we need to vote oh, this budget mm -hmm. all together and then close the, and then I'll, I'll close, close the public, public hearing, hearing after. And vote. Or, yeah. it either. You should probably close the hearing and then, okay. then vote. Uh, I, before we close the public hearing, though, if anyone would like to offer any further comments on the budget. OK, so I'm going to close the public hearing. And uh, is there a motion on the budget as uh, proposed so, so far? with move, this amendment. I move that uh, <coughs> we adopt the budget as reflected by the changes we've made tonight. Further, I'll second. Further discussion? OK. Um, I'm just yep. going to say again that it is the responsibility of the council to look out for more than just the people who write us the emails and who have the ability to attend meetings. Um, and I'm very concerned that this council um, doesn't do that. Um, and we need to be looking out for the voices that aren't at the table. Um, so, thank you. Okay, further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Nay. Okay, so the budget passes. And uh, thank you all for your discussion. Uh, all right, so uh, we are gonna move on to this charter amendment. So this is also a public hearing. So I'm gonna open up the public hearing on the proposed charter uh, change regarding energy efficiency. And I'm gonna welcome um, Richard Fazy back up to the table. He was with us last time. And I know, Rose, you weren't here um, last time to necessarily meet Richard Fazy, so I'll let um, him introduce himself. Um, I think last time I had made the comment that I um, should probably not be both the champion and the expert and try to moderate the meeting all at the same time. And so we're I'm grateful to have you here, um, Richard. Uh, so I'll, I'll let you introduce yourself, I guess. Okay. okay. Great. Thank you. Um, my name is Richard Fazy. I live in Starksboro, so I'm not a Montpelier resident. But um, I have an uh, energy consulting firm called Energy Futures Group. In, Heinsberg and have been working on building energy labeling uh, issues for, for quite a while, including a number of, of um, um, stakeholder groups and, and uh, part of the uh, discussion at the city, at the um, state level for a number of years. So I'm, I'm basically here as a resource um, to help answer any questions or, um, and, and support this initiative moving forward. Okay, any questions about the charter amendment? You should probably open the public hearing. Oh, I think, did I? Should you do that? And well, if I didn't, I'm, I'll do it now. <laughs> I thought I did, but uh, Seek any opening the, the public hearing for the, uh, the second public hearing on this charter amendment. Yeah, Rosie. I didn't get a chance to watch the last meeting. I just read the minutes, and I can't remember if there was discussion about inserting energy before efficiency standards. Was that already? Yes, yes, and dealt that, with, and did we do it? <laughs> we did, and the the language that's attached here um, also does not have the word energy. So let's assume that uh, that is because that's what we approved last time. That that should be in here as well. But we can make that clear. And you should, yeah. If, well, you can do it. and You can also do it when you vote the warning. I, yeah. You should definitely vote. Because it, it's the language is on. Oh, it doesn't have it on the uh, right. warning. It should be on, on the warning as a, as a whole. It's, but the it's word not. energy is not in, oh, the, uh, in the warning, right. So In the warning. It wouldn't be the only change, though, because the budget, well. Yeah, we know yeah, we have we'll to change a new number that. There, right. yeah. But yeah, just making a note that to make sure that it's that change is made in 
at least on, uh, well, like really in both places, I suppose. Okay. So uh, we'll read minimum energy efficiency standards. Yes. Uh, Jack. At a tiny point, I just noticed in the uh, language, the way it was uh, distributed to the council, there's a space missing between powers and and in the heading. Oh, oh. power sand. Power sand, yeah. Oh, power sand. And I don't know if that's I don't think that's really how it is in the, in okay. the charter. So okay. we can just We're double good. check that, but yes. Mm -hmm. um, and that is not on the warning, so should be should be fine. Any further questions? Okay. Um, any comments from the public? Oh, yeah. Okay. I always have these two with me. Tim Heaney, um, real estate broker, Montpelier, and resident. Um, been chair of the Government Affairs Committee for Mont Realtors for a number of years, and not anymore. But I think I've talked with you on conference calls, Richard. Mm -hmm. Some of those meetings. Um, I'm, so basically, I talked with Ann a couple weeks ago about this. She called and said, "Like, oh, I'm thinking of this. You know, some ordinances and thoughts on energy efficiency." And all of a sudden, I'm here tonight, and it's the second reading on this charter change. I'm like, "Whoa, where'd this come from?" Mm -hmm. So it seems like it's come up quickly. In my experience at the state level, listening to those conversations with Efficiency Vermont and with the legislature's considered uh, policies for energy efficiency. The devil's in the details on this one, and there's a lot of details to understand. I'm not sure my player's in a position in terms of governments to take on another level of governments and enforcement. Um, I think we've got our hands full right now in terms of building and planning and um, what we can really handle. So I think you should be very careful about this. The overall charter change piece that I read for the first time tonight when I looked at the, the agenda is really open. And it says, what, I don't even have it in front of me. It was like local, state, and other policies. It, it's a little bit too jello for me. <laughs> uh, I'd like to see it be more specific. And I also think it's, it's well motivated, but if you're concerned about housing and taking care of people and providing good, safe environments where they can be comfortable, there's some other issues we need to talk about as well that might slide ahead on my chart over this. Um, we own a number of properties. We work hard at making them efficient. It's an inch by inch process sometimes, but um, it costs a lot of money, and, and I think a lot of people do keep investing in efficiency, um, even if tenants are paying the energy bills and landlords aren't. You know, we try to, but but I think that the piece that I'm really concerned about here is how you tie it together and look at issues like I go through a lot of houses, a lot of multifamily properties, probably as many as anyone in Montpelier. There's a lot of issues we should be talking about if you want to talk about making housing safer and better. Jack, you know it. I mean, wiring. My goodness. We hit more buildings with novel tube wiring that's still active. Uh, we hit it every day in our office generating sales. Insurance companies won't insure them anymore for new buyers. Lenders don't want to touch them. But they're out there. They're rented. People are living in them. And there are no incentives to improve those situations. I think if you really want to do something right, this ordinance is, a, you know, the concept is great, but I think you're misguided. I think you really should have a, bring together a group, decide what really the priority should be, and align those. And I think some of those priorities need to be some real safety issues, because you really want to wire the place first and get the wiring right, and then you add the insulation. It's kind of a meathead move to add the insulation, and then go back and have to tear it all out and rewire the place. Um, for what it's worth, let's just forgive my lack of focus, but, um, I guess I'm really a little spun up about this. I'm surprised there hasn't been more conversation, and I hope you won't approve it tonight, and we'll open it up for a bigger dialogue. Thanks. Um, go ahead, Donna. What, do you think if we added some incentive, maybe and whether it's a loan process or some financial support, that if you went ahead with this amendment and then considered that that's part of our responsibility is to look for a way to support that happening financially? you say make that happen? Are you talking efficiency I mean, we, moves or make the housing better? Well, the efficiency moves here yeah. that ultimately will make housing better, but if we well, also we, try to do it in some way that's a partnership. I, I do think it's a great idea. I think that's needed because there are a lot of old buildings in Montpelier. The bulk of our housing stock is pre-1978. Yep. And there are a lot of issues that go within that kind of housing in addition to energy issues. Yes, I 
Tim, so Tim, I just want to um, add. I, so I, I hear you about the like, uh, you know, that there's a uh, just a mul multiplicitude of issues that plague our housing stock, and I, um, uh, I guess I would say that. Uh, I don't think these things are mutually exclusive. Let's talk yeah. about all the things that need to happen. Exactly. Um, so uh, I would uh, love to talk further with you about, or or any subgroup of people um, interested in housing, about how we can be um, addressing uh, how, uh, particularly rental uh, safety um, in Montpelier. Uh, but I but I don't hear that necessarily as precluding this. So let's talk about. Um, you know how we can be doing uh, all of the above, and and you know let's let's uh, we'll and we'll work out the details. Um, you know as they as they come up. Yeah. I just, okay. We, just efficiency Vermont's a great organization, yeah. but they have a mission that's pretty focused, yeah. and I, I think we need a little bigger picture here that that can be part sure. of. So I think that's we said the same thing. Future conversation. Let's do it. Great. Thank you. Further comments. I guess Rosie. Um, so I had a lot of concerns with the first version of this ordinance, or not ordinance, it's not an ordinance, it's a charter change. Um, uh, and I appreciate the new language because it doesn't nail us down to a specific ordinance change um, and it gives us the time to think through the pros and cons of every potential uh, ordinance change uh, after we get permission to do it. Um, so I really appreciate, Tim, everything that you say there because I think think you're right there are a lot of this is not <laughs> this is not a solution um, but I think the idea is that we can get permission to do this work and then um, then do the the hard work of figuring out what ordinance gets at these goals um, and what are the implications of that and bring in a lot of stakeholders that in the future that's my hope um, I would urge this council to not be not rush too too fast into um, two ordinances under this without thinking things through, but I am willing to support this because um, it doesn't dictate a specific course of action. Uh, I'll echo much of what Rosie said. Um, I have some specific policy ideas and some potential ordinances that I'm interested in raising. Um, it's just wanted to focus on all of this stuff for now and, and sort of see what happens there, but I think there are still some very tangible things that as a as a city that we can do in terms of renters' rights and things like that, um, that I have been talking to uh, other municipalities in the area and sort of doing some research on my own um, just in terms of, uh, you know, what redress do tenants have and, and things like that. So um, I agree that this is a, a good starting point, um, but there's still a lot of, of other pieces that have to come into place because en energy efficiency is awesome, but if nobody can afford to be in those places because we've prioritized one thing over another or um, so. Great. Okay. Further comments? Any further comments from the public? Okay. Uh, so I'm going to close the public hearing on that. Um, and just looking at our notes here, do we need to, we need to approve this uh, Even though you're going to approve the warning, you should approve the charter this. language, final charter language. If you want to make sure that energy language the is in there, then specifically put it in. Is there a motion? I move that we approve the uh, proposed energy efficiency charter term and then with the addition of the word energy uh, on the first line. Okay. Second. Further comments? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for being here. Um, okay. Um, and on to the uh, warning of the, or uh, the, the ballot. The ballot, yeah, right. So um, we should have a new number for the budget for Article 5. <laughs> Excuse me, Article 5 has uh, increased by the 27,500 that are presented for the half part position. So the new number is 9,466,621. And in addition, I have just updated the warning to reflect the Ooh. charter amendment. First sentence to read enact ordinances enforcing minimum energy efficiency standards. 
then the, the, the version that you have in front of you is uh, the same as you've been receiving for signature, minus those two changes. Did we open I actually think meeting? it's nine four six six one two one. It was just. Yeah, I think that's correct. Yeah. It's only five hundred dollars difference. But Where did he go? He went to double check it. <laughs> he didn't believe me. <laughs> okay. Trust and verify, right? Um, um, this doesn't say that it's a public hearing. It's oh, it is. It should. It is a public. Well, it says it in the subject. So I'll open the public um, right. City hearing yeah. on uh, the. Um, Warning of the ballot. Um, um, yeah. So I would add that in a couple things on that besides the, the number change and the language change, um, call a couple things to attention. One, an initial draft of the, the ballot included um, a potential petitioned article uh, concerning the parking structure. Um, I don't know if Sheila wants to report on that. Oh, sure. Um, so Article 12 uh, is going to be struck because we uh, didn't receive enough petition signatures. We only received 180 uh, verified signatures by the deadline today. Okay. Thank you. Um, now, while we're talking about that, I just want to um, say I, I sort of half expected that maybe someone would be here from that group. Um, and uh, it w had... It, had they been here, I um, had a couple of questions I was hoping to ask them, so I'm just going to say them out loud now and hopefully follow up with them later. Um, one was uh, of the uh, list of criteria on uh, the petition that they, um, you know, had been circulating. I was curious if uh, the group that's appealing uh, the DRB decision had a list of concerns that are outside of the, those criteria. Uh, or uh, if that was the extent of their concerns. Um, I was also curious um, uh, about uh, really what their, their aim was, like what is, what is their goal in the, with the petition or with the appeal. Um, I was very encouraged to uh, read uh, Andrea Standard's, uh, Standard's uh, remarks in the, the bridge the other day, uh, that she's looking for improvements to the project, and I would love to talk about that. Um, so t to that end, I mean, I, I had, um, uh, last time they were here to talk about the petition, they had, uh, you know, we had, a, a, I had thought that we might be meeting at some point, uh, and then they appealed. Uh, so once lawyers are involved, it gets a little trickier, but uh, I guess I would uh, say that I, I so they, I, I want you to know that no one reached out to me from their group. Um, uh, to get in touch uh, about resolving those issues. But uh, I'm just going to say uh, publicly right now that I'm going to reach out to them. And while I'm not in a position to negotiate um, any, anything, I still would love to uh, hear from them. I, I know they have concerns about the content of the, pro uh, the project, as well as the process that happened around it. And I um, am open to um, hearing all, all of that. So you know, if the city can be learning um, from this, uh, uh, Pro process basically from from going through this, um, I am certainly open to that. So uh, anyway, so I just want you all to know that's my plan. Um, Going to be reaching out to them very soon. The only other issue that actually Councilmember Hill raised, um, and unfortunately we don't have John here, although maybe Sheila can answer this, is the issue the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority. We're electing a position for that, even though we don't know what its current status is. So you didn't get that person's bit. Um, oh, there you go. Donna would know. So. I think believe Kim Cheney is the at large who's running. Right, but is the, is is it your is it still continuing? That's what we weren't sure. Yes. Yes. Oh yes. Okay. Did we end up putting money in the budget for that? You don't put money. We put it on the budget. We have our own. You can put it on the ballot chose not to put it on the oh. Okay, so so you're referring to Article 4? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I was wondering about that, too, because it was missing the name. 
So did you get Kim's petition? Oh, well, so this is the warning. The, the actual ballot has the candidates' names. Like, for example, it just says to elect one school district, you know, one city council member, those kind of things. Right. So it doesn't. You still have his petition. I, I believe so, yes. We have another week anyway before petitions are due. Okay. And yes, I'm sorry, but I think maybe I was confused. Sheila, can you repeat what you said? That Article 12 has been struck? Is that what? Oh. It's, it's, not Article 12. it's not Article 12 on this. They took it off already. Uh, oh, I see. Oh, okay. It was Article 12. The former Article 12. The former Article 12. Sorry about that. Okay. Thank you. So that's it. Those okay. are my only things to so call out. Any other public uh, comment about the warning? Okay. Um, so I'm going to close the uh, public hearing there. And I think we need to vote to approve the ballot as amended. <coughs> Is there a motion? I'll make a motion that we approve the ballot as amended. Second. Further discussion? Uh, all in favor? Oh, did you want to? No, I, just wanted to I just wanted to confirm that the city manager was absolutely right. And my fingers are a little bit clumsy. The, uh, I'm going to blame the band aid, but it is 121. There we go. Great. Okay. <laughs> so, do we need to clarify that in our motion? Uh, do you want to clarify I, that, Donna? Just I didn't list a number. So, so I said as so amended, you're voting, and Bill had I'll, amended I'll state earlier. it, and then someone could move it. So you're voting oh. to uh, to approve the warning as presented, except that Article 5 will include the number 9,466,121, and Article 14 will include add the word energy between minimum and efficiency. And that, Donna, that was your intent? Right? Yes, that okay. was my intent. Okay, great. And yep. the second agrees? Okay. Still second. Um, great. So further discussion? Uh, all right, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. I want to be clear in my aye vote that is to approve the petition, not necessarily anything with relation yeah. to the items in it. But yep, fair. Oh, yeah. It's okay. No. I just, people are watching and it's, you know, it's a confusing process, so I just want to. Okay. Approving the ballot. Okay. Uh, all right, so that is the end of our regular business, uh, which is great. Um, so we're going to move on. Oh, did I close the public hearing? I think I did. I think you did. Okay. Um, so moving on to I council reports. Clerk, if she's got it down, she's the one that I do. Have you, do you got it. Okay. <laughs> um, who would like to start? Go ahead, Rosie. You can start. Um, I just wanted to um, let folks know um, that I know federal employees and others impacted by the federal shutdown um, are really struggling. Um, and we do have a number of federal employees um, who live and work in Montpelier. Um, one uh, source of, of help is uh, the free and reduced, uh, is the school meal program. Um, and anybody at any time uh, throughout the year who has a change in income, uh, who has children um, in the schools uh, are, is welcome to um, submit an updated application for free and reduced price meals. Um, and. Um, that you know, they can reach out to their, their school to get that application or find that application on the web. Um, and certainly having a zero dollar paycheck is a change in income. Um, so that is one form of assistance. I know that um, Capstone and the Vermont Food Bank and a bunch of other community organizations have been also um, trying to, to put together some resources as well. Um, and I appreciated Ashley um, bringing that up earlier and, and suggesting that we think about you know, what can Montpelier do. Um, and certainly recognizing that, that lots of other folks face financial hardship all the time as well. Um, but uh, this is a, a group of folks who um, has really been, <laughs> I think we all have a lot of opinions about this, uh, <laughs> this shutdown. And um, so I just wanted to put that out there as a resource that's available to anybody who has a change of income at any point in the year um, and is struggling. Um, I also wanted to, um, again, make a, a plug for running for city council. Um, this is a lovely early meeting tonight. <laughs> um, so don't take this as your, your sample meeting. Um, <laughs> That's an endorsement. <laughs> you haven't heard my report yet. Because I was go on we go. Um, but uh, but I, as you know, I'm not running, so I would encourage folks to run for District 1 or to run for, for any seat. A little competition is great for, for the community, and there are other seats available on um, some of our the 
um, Parks Commission, and we all we just cemetery. Cemetery. So if you are feeling like you need to do something in this time of crazy political uh, upheaval, um, this is a, a good step to take. So that's my plug for running. I'm happy to talk to anybody who is interested um, about what the job entails. Thank you. Yes. Um, I would first and foremost like to thank uh, Chief in the back there. Uh, I, I understand that he was at the State House today representing um, police across the state of Vermont um, and shared uh, some really great information about what we here in Montpelier are doing in terms of fair and impartial policing. Um, and I know that there are a lot of organizations that are really looking to uh, agencies like Montpelier to sort of see um, what we're doing and, and where we can all work together to improve um, what what is currently happening and, and sort of set those goals for where we all want to be. So I really appreciate that uh, Chief could be there today to, uh, to represent Montpelier, but to also represent other law enforcement uh, in Vermont. Um, I also um, want to echo part of what Rosie said. Um, I know that uh, the Vermont Food Bank and other uh, agencies here in central Vermont who uh, are really um, coming together in remarkable ways to make sure that those who did not anticipate um, being without pay for this long are, are, are able to at least <coughs> maintain some semblance of um, food security during a, a really uncertain time. Um, I also um, really want to thank, and I know I came in a couple minutes late, but uh, DPW has really been out there at it nonstop. Um, you know, I, I have been getting up really early lately, and you know, people are out doing the streets, they're out doing the sidewalks, um, and that's a really like, that to me is what like that's why we're all here. That's why we are civil servants, and um, I really appreciate how much extra um, our city staff. Uh, and our council give back to our community. And I think we, we all feel like we should be doing more sometimes, but I also think it's important to acknowledge uh, when, we, when we see it, so. Cool. Thanks. Over there. Uh, Donna or Glenn, one of you? Go ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, I will not be at Baguito's tomorrow morning because today is Thursday. I was there this morning. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and I'm managing to keep track of that, more or less. Um, it's really been going great, uh, and I continue to invite everyone to uh, join me Thursday mornings, talk about this or whatever else. Um, I've also been in touch with uh, folks at Another Way, uh, and I may hold uh, future uh, talk and listen sessions there instead of Baguitos, or in addition to trying to figure that out. The other thing I want to uh, mention is I'm uh, really pleased and excited about the uh, uh, new public art commission that we have been working on. And uh, I want to let everyone know, if you don't already know, that uh, the application process is now open. You have until February 15th, I believe, to submit uh, if you would like to be a commissioner on the public art commission. And I think it would be great to get a lot of really strong applications. I really look forward to that uh, appointment. So thank you, and see you soon. I'm good. Okay. Well, now you're going to make me feel bad. OK. <laughs> well, no, just the, the Regional Planning Commission, I'm on the TAC, and we did have three bridges in Montpelier, and Tom and Kurt were very helpful to me, and we got the three bridges to be number two, three, and four in the region. We didn't get place one. Northfield Bridge is in worse shape. Uh, <laughs> and, and also, GMT is going to be reducing services. They're having a board meeting on January 29th in Burlington, 7.30 in the morning. I'm not going to be back yet. So if anybody wants to go. Wait, did you say 7.30 a.m.? A.m. 7.30 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. in the morning. Yes. And, and I'm sorry, which date? January, January, yeah, January 29th. Wait, this, yep. I'm sorry, that's a public hearing? They're having a board meeting. Oh, it's a board meeting. Yes. Okay. And we do have a local person, uh, Bonnie uh, Wagoner. How do you say her name? Wanninger. What? Okay. From from the regional regional the, planning director. Yes. Yeah, regional planning commission director. She actually got herself on the board this past year and has been a great conduit for information. 
and she is watching out for Central Vermont. But it does look like it is more the outreach areas and not Burlington that's being hit. So even though Next Gen has plans, they, some of those may be impacted. And they are, um, GMTA is having more public hearings in February, but they didn't have the dates yet posted. Uh, I also wanted to mention the Park Commission has been approached by the Fat Bikes. Uh, actually, it's the same Mamba group for Fat Bikes, in case you don't know it. It's bikes, I guess big tires, but they also have less air to go charging down the hill when there's snow conditions are right. So that's another one of those new issues that in, indeed have some conflicts with walkers and skiers, and so there'll be some meetings at, at the Park Commission that you may hear about. And likewise, please, cars, don't ignore the pedestrians. All that splashy, wet ice. You know, I got hit, many people have complained to me, and pedestrians, likewise. All this water from the rain is in, stuck in the sidewalks. Public works can't get it out. Please be careful, and people will have to walk on the street until it gets recovered through lots of freezing snow and then work from DPW. So the next couple of days are going to be nasty for everybody and just share the roadways and be considerate. Thank you. And yeah, just remember they do oh, have yeah. something. And then um, I was uh, happened to be at the State House this morning for an event at work and I was talking to one of the members of the uh, House Government Ops Committee which has a jurisdiction for our charter changes and he said that there are already many bills introduced in the legislature to ban plastic bags. And so okay. we were in, he's anticipating a pretty good reception for our charter change. And uh, he knew more about that than about the non-citizen voting. But I think we're potentially looking good. Great. Uh, Rosie. Um, so I did remember, sorry, um, okay. I had, um, chatted with Bill about this today. Um, I had promised at one point last month or maybe the month before that I would write a, a draft of a letter to our legislators about public meeting law changes that might be useful to us. I have not gotten to that. I have been absolutely underwater at work um, and I do not anticipate getting to that. So I am putting that out there. If somebody else wants to write that or, you know, work with Bill on that um, or, you know, if it's not important, we can drop it as well. But I, I can't do that at this point. So. Thank you. Just solidifying your reputation as a slacker. I know, huh? such a slacker. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I forgot the um, the evaluations. Oh, Should yeah. We oh, that's, that's, well, before we leave this, um, okay. was there anybody else that wants to pick up uh, writing that? If not, that's fine. But What were you writing about the open meeting laws? So we wanted to suggest to the legislature that um, we would benefit from being able to have some kind of public electronic message board where we could have some preliminary discussions in a public setting but online where the public could read them and see them um, and that might save some time in our meetings and actually be more accessible because people could easily see what we'd said rather than having to tune in um, or watch a video recording or that kind of thing. Um, so just suggesting to the legislature that that would be a, a change that we would like to see to public meeting law. If somebody's willing to do it with me, I I can definitely commit to like a set amount of time with someone. I just can't guarantee that I'm going to get it all done. We can do it. Staff <laughs> can do it. Okay, if, if, if that's I'm, something the council is of legislature. I'm personally uh, questioning it because I have a very hard time with those kind of things myself. And so if I can't choose not to participate in that, that's supplementing meetings. It's not s separate standing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It would be in addition to meetings. <coughs> yeah, I, okay. I have trouble with those, but go ahead. Well, maybe that's something we can talk about. Maybe we should talk about. Uh, well, uh, as, a, as an item at some point? Uh, sure. So I guess one option is to direct city staff to do something like that. If we're going to do that, maybe we make it an agenda item for next time so we actually we can hear Donna's well, concern and discuss and what we're public. telling them and to do. And see what we think to all yeah. together as a council and um, go from there. Okay. Um, okay. Does that sound reasonable, Don? Yeah, it makes me think of Google Drive. Some of the committees try to use that, but it's really not open to public access. And well, we'd have to, I mean, so I, yeah, I'm not yeah. advocating for or against it, but we'd have to deal with the tech, yeah. you know, yeah. it would have to be open. But I think it, it probably does make more sense to have it on an agenda if it's 
to, for the council to determine that it's a legislative priority and hear from the public for pro and con. And I think it's a really interesting topic. I would love to talk more about, particularly Google Drive, actually. Just putting that out there. Yes. I think it's just also another way for people to engage in a different format because sometimes, you know, sitting down and watching is challenging, catching mm -hmm. snippets is challenging, and, you know, for some people it's a really just convenient way, like you're at work, you have a thought, oh, there it is, it's at least saved, you can go back and look at it. It's just, it's a, a different market, different audience. Mm -hmm. and Okay, for some future discussion. Um, was there any, oh, you want to so think, I, yes. I just, uh, I wanted to get this out there because I'm gonna be gone for the next couple of weeks and whether or not we do it, but put it, I know you had a deadline on bills, which I did very begrudgingly with a little bit of time I've had left. So, um, uh -oh. so, but I wanted this out there and if you want to amend it or if other people, I didn't get any comments except from Ann and I incorporated yours. Uh, and so it, use it or okay. modify it, but if you'd like us to do our own self-evaluation around this same time, then and there you, it is. Uh, you sent this around via email, is that right? Well, I did, I, I did this revision today, right before oh, okay. the meeting. So um, if you send me the uh, digital version of this. You got it. Did. You got it. Oh, okay. It's in your okay. mailbox. Okay. okay, great. Well, very good then. So then you so can. Yeah, I'll, I'll Recirculate it, I guess. Okay, no, I guess send it to everybody so you could say yes. Let's just use it and okay. see if it works, and, and if it doesn't, then great. And maybe um, have the same deadline. You know, trying to get it done by the thirty-first. Does that sound reasonable to others? I mean, that's a fair bit of time. So, okay, uh, great. And um, do you want to set a date for? Well, yeah, that was actually going to be my, okay. my thing. Unless Never mind. Any, any other Go. council members. Have? I mean, I don't mean to no, no, steal no. it. I'm sure you're probably going to say it too. Nope. So I, um, I just wanted I wanted to remind people to make sure to fill out the evaluation. Um, Jamie is going to compile uh, all those uh, results, and we need a date to talk about them um, together with Bill. So um, if I, I figured now would be a good time to find a date to do that. Um, one hypothesis is that um, we could pick, uh, you know, a Wednesday that we're not meeting. Um, for example, February 6th. I don't know if that works for people, but no? No, but the 20th would. Or the... the oh, the 20th or the, the, of February? Yeah. How does... Well, so... I, uh, hmm. It's a long ways off. It is a long ways off, but it's not necessarily bad to um, hold that for us as well because um, this is also uh, a contract negotiation year. And so, um, yeah. well, I mean, one possibility is that we can do both the evaluation and the contract stuff together in one night. Um, another possibility is that it might just be easier to separate them, but. Um, can you clarify? Yeah. Not the city manager's contract, the additional term? Contracts are all no the, the city, city managers. The city managers on the same night as the evaluation. Right, like we could right we could do the city manager's evaluation and contract together on the same night, or we can try to separate them. Um, uh, Bill, I'm curious for your thoughts on this. My inclination is to actually separate them, just so that um, we've done it both ways in the past. Okay. But. So, but if if you all have opinions on that, um, I'm inclined to separate them too. Okay. Um, I'm free on the 20th. You're free on the 20th. So let's at least book ourselves for the 20th on 6.30. Um, uh, do we want to pick a different day? You said the 6 doesn't work for you. Um, um, I just, I... And, um, it, before you go, the, um, the only other constraint that I think we need to have is that we should be doing this before town meeting day. So. Both um, of those actually, are tentative trial dates, and sometimes... Who knows what happens? Yes. Okay. So I will put it on my calendar. Okay. Outlook, relatively good I'll be there, but if I have to stay, I have to stay. Okay. If we bump yep. it later because it's less stuff. Yeah, it doesn't um, like be 6.30. So I mean, I don't know. I've ended up, like, waiting until, like, 11.30 oh. at the courthouse for a jury to come back. So it, wow. you know... You never know. I, you just can't tell. Sometimes it's super quick. Other so times it's... So is it 6.30 then is the one we're going to have? And then you'll let us know whether it's still Yeah, I can. I mean, I'll have my phone. Usually, is it 6th it, then 20th or just as long the 20th? as the jury's charged by like 4.30. Not the 6th, just the 20th. Oh, the 6th. Okay. 
so far, anyway. Um, well, we can try for another. Um, is, is there any date before the 20th? But just in case we need something after those two before town meeting day. So you're referring to two. So I had I, th I thought that's what Glenn and yeah, Ann said yeah, they wanted two, two meetings. Two no, no, I know, but we, okay. but we only have one day so far. Right, that's right. correct. Yeah, yeah we're trying so to find the second I'm saying <laughs> if we want to, I'd rather have another one before the 20th. Right, exactly. right. So it, we're not waiting too late. So I'm just gone the 5th through the 7th. Other than that, I'm pretty open. Oh, okay. Um, what if, I mean, the 4th? I could do the 4th. I'm not back yet. When are you back? 6th. Back the sixth, the uh, seventh, and she's back the seventh. Are you, are you back during the day the seventh? Like, could you do an evening meeting on the seventh? Uh, I, I think so. Yeah. Works for me. Uh, is that yep. every, everybody's Works shaking their me. heads? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Seven. Okay. Well, let's um, six thirty. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's tentatively plan on the uh, seventh at six thirty. Um, and I would like to be um, potentially, like, depending on how the time goes, potentially starting talk, to talk about contract stuff then, but um, let's reserve the 20th um, if we don't get to it. Makes sense. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Yes. Okay, that's it for me. Uh, Jill. Just real quick, if any council members didn't get to sign these liquor license apps, uh, the liquor board gets a little finicky if everybody doesn't sign them. <laughs> Um, I don't have anything particularly exciting, although I will note, you know, we talked about the federal shutdown and just say that has hampered our um, trying to process through our loans and grants for the wastewater water resource recovery facility, and some of those are through federal oh, wow. agencies, and so that has stalled. Um, so there, there are effects beyond, I mean, obviously the out of work work, well, actually they're not even out of work, the workers who are having to work and not be paid, so they can't seek another job. Um, but there are, all, are secondary impacts to trying to get things moving. So that's happening. Um, we received today an Act 250 recess order, which uh, gave us the, it was the follow-up from last week's Act 250 hearing outlining everything that needs to be done that is faster than we expected it. So that's great. Uh, means that the uh, due date for everything to come in is February 25, which is about the time we'd asked to recess the meeting to anyway to get everything in order. So that's great, keeps us right on track. And then a response date of March 12th. So that was good news. We also, as we know, received the jurisdictional opinion yesterday about uh, whether the full thing should be in Act 250 or just uh, pieces. So that's good news. And uh, we are trying to work out some details about TIF. Um, and so that's all that. So a lot of things happening on a lot of fronts, but I'm glad we got the budget done and the ballot set and on to whatever comes next. Great. Um, so I think that's, that's everything. So um, without objection, we're going to consider the meeting adjourned. Wow, record Good time. Work, everybody.